I sat before the 32-inch television in my hostel lounge, watching the news. I had heard a tiny piece of information about earlier. It was about the murder of three high school students at a neighboring high school. The school got locked after the event and investigations commenced immediately. The news had spread fast and everyone had their different opinions on the event. I also had mine. Two years ago, on my 16th birthday, my best friend died in the school toilet and I was the first to know. When the school authorities found out that I knew about it, they begged me to stay silent about it forever and further placed me on a scholarship which had me stuck in the school. I was now always under their watch and lived as stealthily as possible to protect my life because it would be easy to take me out and hide my body as they did with my best friend. So I walked out of the lounge to my room where I laid on my side trying to clear my mind of the traumatic experience after Luisa's death. I quickly fell asleep and woke up the next morning to attend classes. I entered the class to find a familiar face addressing my course mates. It was my teacher from high school that resigned after Luisa's death. He'd grown now and looked more graceful than he used to be with his beard full and luring wide chest that had endured the strain of gym workouts. He didn't seem to remember me or he acted like he didn't as he continued addressing the class while I had my seat. Once again, my name is Dwayne Edison. He let out a sigh of relief and walked out of the class hurriedly. I was tempted to approach him, but my uneasiness from last night's news hadn't dissipated. I still felt depressed and the topic wasn't going to leave the lips of my course mates anytime soon. I heard the students' lungs were harvested and sewn back neatly that it was almost invincible. I heard someone say behind me in a conversational tone with someone, I attempted to stand up and leave the hall but decided to get more information on the event from sheer curiosity. That's not possible, the other student whizzed. I know, but I heard that cut wasn't in the chest region but under the armpit. They were lucky to have found out about it and the police are now looking for suspected human parts traffickers, the loud feminine voice retorted. How do you know all these? My dad's a police officer and my mom works as a nurse in the school's medical, she snapped. These pieces of information are legit and are at the tip of my fingers. So it did happen, and it was a case of organ harvesting and even much more, but that's all I know for now. Moreso, since the organ harvester is still at large, don't share this information with anyone. She paused and whispered so softly that I could only hear because I was paying full attention. Some thinks it's one of the teachers, but they're all vindicated by the school and have gotten work elsewhere. So, someone asked, no college student is safe, especially those at the age of 18. That's the age range of the recent killings, she replied and must have caught me listening. I heard a silent thug on her questionnaire's shoulder as they walked past me toward the door. I shouldn't have listened. I buried my head in my hands and sighed deeply with glints of worry and fear forming a cloud over my thought process. I was curious now and had the urge to find out what had happened. Later that evening, on my way to the hostel, I heard a whisper in the pitch darkness I had walked past. I turned swiftly to catch the silhouette of a familiar figure waving at me. I strained my eye further and deducted it was Edison, our new science lecturer. Sandra, he waved with a smile on his cheek. Good evening, sir. It's cold. Let's have a cup of coffee down there, he pointed to the faint light outside the hostel. I knew they served the best coffee there and subconsciously started walking towards the light with him. How did it end up? He asked me a question I didn't understand. What? I raised a brow and let the cup of coffee out of my lip. Its warmth slapped my face, but I was more worried about his question. Two years ago, in the toilet. Luisa. He squinted, probably guessing if I was the one or not. I understood him, but it was too dangerous to admit knowledge of Luisa's death, which the school begged me to keep, so I kept a straight face. I'm sorry, I, I don't remember anything, I said. When it wasn't looking like he believed me, I had mental illness last year, I said, to further defend my ignorance. Oh, sorry about that, he whispered. See me in the lecturer's quarters tomorrow morning for your next project evaluation. He exhaled and paid the bills, then stormed away. He was angry, but I couldn't tell why and couldn't worry, lest so I had to rethink and decide to confide in him when I see him in the morning. I needed to talk to someone. I woke up the next morning earlier than I used to and quickly prepared to go to his quarters. It was a few miles away, but I got there before 9 a.m. and knocked on his big red mahogany door. Come in, I heard him answer behind the door. I knew he saw me when I arrived from the flickering red light on the CCTV at his front porch. Good morning, he greeted me. 
He wasn't fully dressed, so he excused himself to get dressed while I had my seat. He had a lot of papers clustered together on the table and my curiosity to read its content won me over as I lifted the pages and went through it briefly. It included his CV and documents which felt warm on my palm like they were just printed. I went through the places he had worked and saw my high school, then a school two cities away. I became bored until my eye caught the name of the school that had a murder case of three high school students. I also found out he just had the degree to teach in a college and my school was his first try. I was busy checking the documents when I heard his footsteps. I quickly dropped the papers and sat upright. Do you have somewhere you should be? He asked quietly and turned to see him wearing an apron with gloves and a nose mask. Are you going somewhere? Yes. No girl, you are the lab rat. He giggled and bolted towards me, catching my right arm. I should be on my way, I revolted. You should be here, he giggled and slapped my face, then pushed me to the floor. I scurried away from his feet, but he stomped his foot on my chest and stood above me. I groaned in pain and pushed, but he kept smiling and brought out a syringe from his apron pocket. As he silently whistled a song, I couldn't tell. You wouldn't be a different case and would soon meet Louisa on the other side. He finally injected me and lifted me upon his shoulder as he walked up the stairs. Whatever he injected me with had not completely knocked me out like he had thought. I got a hold of a knife protruding from his apron pocket and as he ascended the stairs, I stabbed his neck. He flung me off his shoulder and we both started falling down the stairs. He remained still after a while, maybe dead. I crawled toward the couch where I picked up my phone to dial 911. It rang, but I passed out. Did you enjoy the first story? If you did, I would love it if you would subscribe to the channel. Mr. Green was a tall, thin man with bulging black eyes that sat behind a pair of wire-framed glasses and an inexplicable love for fedoras. He was also my history teacher. In the classroom setting, Mr. Green was a decent teacher. The word decent being used liberally. He was not the funniest or the most engaging teacher the university had to offer, but he definitely got the job done. I understood his explanations, and his notes were easy to comprehend. When he gave assignments, they were simplified. I wasn't the brightest student, but when it came to history, I understood perfectly. Which is why I didn't understand why I was doing this first year course again in my second year. My issues had apparently tracked from missing assignments I was absolutely certain I had turned in, to a giant F on the exam which I was certain was impossible because I knew what I had written. It was not until I started noticing the deeply unsettling way Mr. Green looked at me during classes and whenever we crossed paths in the hall, and the fact that he somehow knew my name despite the fact that I'd never spoken in his class and I was one of the many students, that I started to really get suspicious. I had questions, and all of them pointed to the teacher himself. Was I imagining things? Or was there a sexual undertone to the way he looked at me with lingering gazes? Especially when I wore outfits that revealed more skin than usual. But these were questions I could not bring myself to ask outside the privacy of my head. Falsely accusing a faculty member of misconduct was a serious offense, punishable by suspension or even expulsion. As months passed and Mr. Green made no moves, I started to think I was imagining things. But then, one day after class, he asked me to wait behind and meet with him. I wasn't sure what I was expecting, but it definitely wasn't what I got. He told me that I was flunking his course again, and at this rate, I would carry the course over for yet another year. I argued that it was not possible, but he brought out one of my test scripts and showed it to me. I had, in fact, failed. But on close observation, I realized that his marking scheme seemed unfair, and I was drastically losing marks for every mistake. I tried to bring it up, but he claimed that he was this way with everyone, and as I had no proof otherwise, I fell silent. He mentioned that he taught a class here every night, and if I wanted to pass, I'd have to be in attendance, starting from that night. Reluctantly, I agreed. The thought of being a third-year student in a first-year class scared me. I worried about being here with him at night, but I was comforted by the fact that I'd not be alone. It was a class, after all. Besides, he hadn't done anything suspicious. At night, I came to class, only to find it empty. I was starting to think I'd misheard 
when Mr. Green came in. I asked about the rest of the class, and he told me I was early, and they'd be here shortly. Thirty minutes passed, and there was no sign of any other students. Suddenly, I became aware of the fact that Mr. Green and I were here alone. He came and sat with me, and talked about my grades, and how failure would look bad on my results, and affect my future, and maybe even delay my graduation. I thought he was being motivational, until his hand rested on my thigh. I flinched, and he retreated, only to go around and stand behind me. He continued to touch me inappropriately while he talked. I stood up and asked him to stop, but he smiled and said this was the way to pass his course. Irritated, I walked away intending to leave, only to find the door locked. I was trapped with him. He confessed to everything, failing me on purpose, shredding my assignments, arranging this meeting. He said I had no choice but to give him what he wanted. He tried to reach for me and I resisted. He got upset and started to get violent with me and groped me. Before he could go further, I retrieved a can of pepper spray from my bag and got him right in the face. While he was squirming, I kicked him in the jewels, snatched the keys from him, and fled. The next day, I reported him to the principal. But to my utter disbelief, I was threatened with expulsion if I didn't stop. And so I did. The next week, I transferred to a new class and started to save up for a taser. But that was not the last I'd hear of Mr. Green. He was greatly offended by his failed attempt to have his way with me, and he showed in a way that only I would know he was responsible, and in a way that discredited me if I ever tried to oust him again. I noticed that something had happened when the students I passed in the hallway started to give me strange looks, some of them seemingly disgusted, even though I had never had a conversation with most of them. It took almost a week to find out that someone had spread a rumor that I had slept around with fellow students for money and with my lecturers in exchange for good grades. And the reason I was still in Mr. Green's class and finally had to switch course was that he was the only one who refused my advances. Naturally, I knew who had spread the rumor even though I didn't know how and certainly couldn't prove it. I returned one evening to my dorm to see that someone had gotten real creative and spray-painted GO TO HELL SLUT on my door. I thought my life could not get any worse. But that might have jinxed it, because in the month that followed it certainly did. Pictures of me surfaced online. Indecent pictures of me, in various degrees of nudity. They were pictures I'd never sent to anyone because I had never taken them. The pictures were photoshopped. And I could tell because I could link a couple to the normal pictures on my Instagram. Some of the pictures involved me with male students, although they were conveniently dressed in the photos. But they seemed to be spreading word that I was in fact the one in the pictures, bragging about how it was easy to get with me. I started getting advances from students, and when I turned them down, they resorted to calling me names. The school faculty caught wind of the matter, and I was suspended and scheduled to face the disciplinary panel. My life was ruined. I was already preparing myself for the move away from the university and from the town when I got a visit from Lucas. He was a tech wizard and the only friend I'd managed to make since I got admitted. And it turned out, despite the rumors, he was in fact still my friend. And he had with him the proof of my innocence. Enough to defend myself before the panel. He had compiled the original photos and put them side by side with the doctored images of me. But it was not enough. It would only be a matter of time before Mr. Green tried something else. I admitted everything to Lucas, and he said he had a plan to expose everything. His thought was since Mr. Green was still hurt enough to continue tormenting me, it was likely he still wanted to get with me. Asking me to trust him, he told me what to do. I was to visit Mr. Green in the evening while he was grading papers and accuse him, to which Lucas anticipated he would deny it at first. Then I was to beg him to end the torment and offer to do whatever it took to make it all go away. Whatever happened from there, I was to play along and trust that Lucas would have my back. It happened as Lucas predicted. I approached Mr. Green in his office, and when I pleaded, he said, the only way was for me to let him have his way with me and allow myself to be subject to whatever degradation he would put me through. 
playing along as Lucas instructed. I asked if that would make all the rumors and the fake nudes go away, and he assured me it would. After uttering a silent prayer that Lucas knew what he was doing, I agreed to it. He asked me to take off my blouse, and reluctantly I did, disgusted by the way his eyes roamed my exposed chest. Mr. Green unzipped his pants and got naked from the waist down. He leaned back against his desk and asked me to get on my knees before him. He was not done speaking when the door burst open. Standing in the doorway was a flustered Dean and two security guards. Without waiting to hear Mr. Green's side, they put him in handcuffs and dragged him away while he rambled on about how I had seduced him. The Dean apologized to me while avoiding eye contact until I was fully dressed again. Curious, I asked how he knew to come when he did, and why he believed me now. And he told me that he'd been in his office playing poker on his laptop when he usually did, when someone took over his laptop screen and played a live video from a hidden camera somewhere on the bookshelf that neither I nor Mr. Green had noticed. As he spoke, Lucas casually walked past the open doorway and winked at me. Instantly, I understood that he'd snuck in there and tapped the room. The Dean promised that all my offenses would be cleared and I'd be compensated somehow, and Mr. Green would get jail time. In the days that followed, the eyes continued to stare, but they were sympathetic and ashamed now. I could only hope that the students before me who had given in to him would find some solace now. The plant biology teacher asked us to come to his house in the woods, eventually after months of persuasion. He often spoke about the uniqueness he enjoyed living in the wild and the serene environment, but it looked like a fairy tale as we lived most of our lives in the heart of the city. I was convinced it would be a great time as I carefully selected my friends that would be going there with me after a few of our other classmates had visited. It was a weekend trip and he had told us not to inform the other students as they only spent a night there but was willing to accommodate my group of three in his home for the weekend, so I was expected to be discreet. At the age of 20, it was my first time leaving the city and driving upstate, though with the help of a GPS live location he shared with me. We drove a rented Hillux van in the steep pathway and parked nearby, not far from the road and a minute walk to his house. Why would he get a house this far in the woods? Jeremy asked me as we kept going down the shallow path with dried leaves crushing under our boots. Isn't it peaceful, I chuckled. Aren't you afraid of wild animals? Tesco whispered, even though it was still evening and there was sunlight peeking through the forest roof. I'm sure he would have made precautions, I guessed as we arrived at the wooden house. It was built like a modern country home, but with archaic sculptures acting as scarecrows. Immediately we entered what seemed like the front lawn. I saw bird feathers tied to the pillars holding the dwarf fence. I never knew he had any sort of spirituality but took my eyes off it to avert my friend's attention. Have you called him? Jeremy asked behind me as I raised my hand to knock on the door. Let's knock at least. The door groaned as it opened to us, startling me. Oh, welcome guys. His gray beard and blue eyes welcomed us behind the door. We walked in to see him wearing a white robe and a pair of Nike slides with his soul dirty like he had walked on dirt. Coffee or chocolate? He chuckled with a broad smile. Chocolate, I picked up and so did the rest. All right, since you guys will be here for the weekend, there's no need to rush things. We would take a walk later in the night and begin the tour tomorrow. His smile broadened. Is that fine? Yes, we echoed and watched him walk into the kitchen. Night came and we prepared to go into the woods as planned. We wore our boots, lamp, and strapped knives and scabbard and began the stroll. A few minutes into the walk, I injured my heel and I was advised to go back. Our teacher was reluctant to let me go alone, but I assured him I could handle it and limped back to the house. When I got to the front door, it was locked, and I remembered I hadn't collected the key, so I went through the back. There was a little garden in the backyard, and as I walked past it, my leg hit something. I took the next limp and kicked something harder. I furiously pointed the lamp to the floor to see what I had hit and found skulls femurs and broken ribs shooting out of the earth. I looked around to find out that the whole backyard was a shallow grave. From the distance, I could hear their chuckle as they laughed and giggled back home. Out of fear, I quickly limped away, leaving my friends alone and running for my life. It was the last time I heard from them and the teacher.
Jade! My friend Haley screamed. She wrapped me with a hug and we both squealed, excited to meet during the weekend. We waited for Sophie, our other friend. We had been best friends since high school and we were still as close as ever. Girls! Sophie squealed as she came to meet us. As one, we walked to the hotel, aware of the heads that turned our way. We were all pretty and we knew it. I fluffed my blonde hair as we walked inside the hotel and we all giggled. I worked as a model while Haley and Sophie worked as social media influencers. We were all doing well in our jobs and we were quite popular. As we caught up on things in our lives, we reminisced on our high school life. I was pretty proud of my past and it was what shaped me up to be who I am presently. I lived a life only a few people my age could afford. Remember all those girls with braces? Haley asked. She fluttered her eyelids at the waiter that served us food and he blushed before walking away quickly. I nodded, snorting. It had been our delight to make their lives miserable. Many times we had been reported as bullies. It didn't matter though, we now were successful ladies. After the meal, we got into our cars and drove to our respective homes. A call woke me up and I reached over for my phone. It was Haley and she sounded panicked. What do you mean she was injured? I asked, aghast. Haley explained to me that Sophie was in a bad condition and gave me the address of the hospital. I drove there in a panic. My, my mind was coming up with various scenarios. I winced when I saw Sophie's face. Her face was bruised and her front two teeth were missing. She was crying silently when I came in. Haley met my eyes and grimaced. I tried to comfort her, but she was worried about her teeth and how it had ruined her appearance. I told her she would just fix an artificial ones and she seemed to calm down a little. I asked her how it happened and she dissolved into tears again. She said she went to get something at the supermarket close to her house and had just entered her compound when a masked man tackled her to the ground. He had covered her mouth so she could not scream for help. It was dark enough that there was no one around. He used pliers to pull out her teeth and she went unconscious. I shook my head in horror, unable to comprehend why anyone would do that. I left Sophie, promising to check on her the next day. Haley and I kept coming back to check on Sophie and offer any assistance we could. You mean Haley hasn't been here this morning? I asked Sophie. She shook her head in the negative and I frowned. That was strange. We always met at the hospital. I decided to call her. It got picked up the second time. The person on the other end told me that Haley was badly injured and was waiting for an ambulance. I could hardly believe it. I rushed out without telling Sophie anything and just drove to Haley's place. The ambulance beat me there and I followed them back to the hospital. I stopped in my tracks as I saw her. Haley's front teeth were missing. Oh no. I drove back home with, with shaking hands. I was convinced I was the next target. First it was Sophie, then Haley. It was more than coincidence. Someone was attacking us. I parked in front of my house and got down. The bushes in front of my house rustled and I paused. I took a deep breath and waved it off as paranoia. I walked up to my door and fished for my keys. I entered my house and was about to close the door when it got wrenched from my hands. I staggered back, dazed. A masked man entered and closed the door. I started to shake. It was my turn. I stood my ground watching as he approached me. I fiended left and dashed for the door. He caught my two feet before I reached the entrance and he dragged me by my waist. I screamed and I reached my hands for his head. His mask came off during the struggle and I turned to see his face. The shock of his eyes meeting mine stalled his actions enough that I jerked out of his hands and ran outside. I hopped in my car and drove to the nearest police station. I told them what had happened and they put out a search warrant. I was still coming to terms with what happened. I recognized the man that attacked me. His name was Simon. We went to the same high school. I could not mistake him for someone else. The three of us used to make fun of him because his front teeth were missing. Now he was out for revenge and I was the last one on his list. I didn't sleep in my place that night but instead lodged in a hotel. The next evening I went to my place with the thought that Simon could not be stupid enough to come to my apartment again. I sighed as I closed the door and dropped my keys on the table. I went to the kitchen to get a glass of juice. Jade. I froze, cupped my lips. I slowly turned to see Simon looking at me. My legs gave out and I fell, glass cup shattering on the floor. Please, I choked out, crawling away. Simon laughed and pulled out his pliers. My face went pale and I screamed in horror. There was no way I would let him pull out my teeth. 
I stood up shakily and ran as fast as my legs could carry me. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I ran all the same. His footsteps were just behind me, but I had an advantage. It was my house and I was very familiar with it. I dashed into my room and I dove under my bed. I covered my mouth with my hands to conceal the sounds that were escaping. I saw his shoes pause in front of my room as he wondered where I was. He entered the room and tears ran down my face. My heart was beating so loudly such that I was sure it would alert him. He came over to the bed and he threw the covers down. Then he chuckled and he knelt down. I'd laid there frozen in fear. Just then, sirens blared. He cursed as he quickly rushed up and ran out. I remained under the bed for a long time. I came out when I was sure that it was safe. I met the police in my living room. Simon escaped before they got to my apartment.